Church family, it is a joy again to be together with you, to sing God's praises. It's on, yeah. All right, church family, it is a blessing again to be together, to be together with you again, to be in the house of God together, to sing God's praises, to hear God's word for God's glory. The call to worship this morning is from Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Father, our hearts were restless until we found our rest in you, until you opened our hearts and we receive the gift of righteousness. Jesus, you are our great high priest. It is you that bridged the chasm that laid before us sinners and holy God. You gave us access by faith to the throne of grace that we are standing in right now. Holy Spirit, we rejoice in the gift of hope that you have graciously applied to our lives as followers of Christ. Our past is forgiven because you declared us righteous, Father. We have faith today because of your faithfulness to your promises. And we have hope for tomorrow because you are on the throne. In Jesus' name, amen. May be seated. Well, I want to invite you to pray with me at this time and pray for the things that might be heavy on your hearts to be uh, in mind uh, or you have in your mind the things that pertain to our, our church family and our church body, to the, to the world around us. And, you know, mentioned in the uh, opening time, we got lots of, lots of folks sick. Even as I was standing there, I was thinking about, oh, yeah, I'm not going to see them today. I'm not going to see them today because of flu and cold and, and things like that. So we praying generally for the well, just for the health of our people and our ability to gather as the people of God and to worship. And uh, we want to pray for Ryan and Shelby Webb, who are ministering in Papua New Guinea. I want to continue to pray for the Webbers that should be safely now arrived in uh, Yaoundé and Cameroon, uh, beginning, their, uh, beginning their transition to their ministry in Cameroon. Um, so I want to invite you to do that, to lift up in your own heart and your own mind the things that might be heavy on your hearts this morning and entrust ourselves to the Lord's care together. So let's, let's do that. Our Father, we come to you, uh, first of all, acknowledging that we don't deserve, we don't even deserve a glimpse of heaven. We remember uh, the Lord's words to Nicodemus in John 3 that we can't even see the kingdom of God unless you intervene in our lives and give us new birth. Give us new life, new eyes, new hearts. And so we just openly confess that, that neediness, that honesty, that apart from your intervention, we don't deserve to, to see heaven. We're unable to redeem ourselves from sin and death and the devil and hell. And in spite of that, you have given Christ. You have given us Christ. You have given your son, Jesus and he is far more precious than heaven. He is far stronger than sin, death, the devil, and hell. And so we praise you in this moment, and we thank you in this moment that our sins, though they are many, your mercy is more, your grace is greater. There is more grace in Christ than there is sin in us. And so... We praise you, and we come to you openly and honestly, knowing that um, you're the only one that can cure our doubts and heal our wounds, and you're the only one that can be faithful in the ways that we need someone to be faithful for us. You're the only one who has been righteous enough to take shelter under, and through Christ and Christ alone, you take away our sin 
take away our death. You destroy the devil. And you bring us into fellowship with God. And you give us all that belongs to yourself. In Christ we receive all and more than we could ever hope for. God, we pray that the mission and the ministry of Jesus would be successful in Papua New Guinea among a people that know very little of your grace, very little of eternal life. And so we pray for Ryan and Shelby as they continue to translate curriculum, as they continue to translate the Bible, as they continue to love on the people in this remote village, that they would be empowered and be given strength and that their ministry there would be a roaring success and that believers would be discipled and that pastors would be trained up and that, that there'd be a healthy church in this remote tribe in Papua New Guinea because of the work of the webs. God, we pray for the world at large, the conflict in the Middle East and Israel, and we pray, God, that in the midst of great sorrow and great trouble and great pain and great loss and great evil, that your name would be known and that people would run to you uh, for shelter, uh, run to you for a, a hope that um, isn't as fragile as peace in the Middle East is. God, we pray that you would I equip and mobilize and enable your people in that land to shine as lights in a crooked and twisted generation. God, we pray that as we are burdened by things present, maybe illness, uh, maybe broken relationships, maybe even just a coldness toward you, that you would be for us what we continually see we just cannot be for ourselves and that you'd heal and restore and help and encourage and give us, uh, give us a joy based on Jesus that can't be easily taken. Not talking about emotional highs or easy thrills, but the slow, hot, burning ember of joy and confidence in Christ who never fails us. Help us to give joyfully. Help us to love each other well and receive your word with gladness in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Kids may come up for the children's sermon. So, uh, I would suppose over the years, uh, I've been asked maybe a hundred different times uh, why I believe in Jesus. And when someone asks me that question, I usually tell them, well, I have a lot of answers. I have some scientific ones, some philosophical ones, some experiential ones. I have my testimony, my story. But the real reason at the end of the day is the theological one, okay, which is this. I, before I believed in Jesus, I was dead in the water. And God said to me, live. And my eyes were open and my ears were open. And my heart started to beat. And I looked up and guess what? God was there carrying me safe to shore. Okay, God was rescuing me. And as he was doing that, he said, hey, it's okay. Go ahead, kick your feet a little. <laughs> right? But that's not because he, he needed me. That's because he was uh, including me in what he was doing. Now, uh, today, uh, Pastor Corey is going to read this verse and pre preach on it. It's a Philippians 2, 12 through 13. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So that's a command to us to work, our, work out our own salvation with seriousness. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, that's a little bit confusing, right? Because it's saying you do this because God's doing it, right? <laughs> well, what does that mean? Isn't it usually one or the other? Well, here's a good analogy, I think. This has helped me. Do any of you guys like to swim? 
Yeah? Did you guys have swimming lessons last year? What did you learn in swimming lessons last year when you took them? You remember any of the strokes? Were you bobbing, you know, or doing front crawls, floating? Are any of you good at floating? So I really like to swim. I, I uh, could never pass swimmers, though, because for some reason I can't float. I literally, I just, my legs go down, I sink straight to the bottom. It's, it's really bad. So when my uh, second-born son, Johnny, was uh, just a little kid, uh, we got him in these really cool swimming lessons where I got to actually get in the pool with him and, and do the stuff. And so there was a teacher, and the teacher would tell his parents basically how to help our kids learn to swim. And there was this specific day where the, the coach, I, I guess you could call her, uh, said to the kids, hey, we want you to swim using the front crawl. We want you to swim all the way to one end of the pool and all the way back. Now, here's the thing. My son Johnny at the time hated to get his face wet. He would refuse even, uh, like, bath time. He just would not let his face get wet. And so here I am uh, trying to get my son to swim, and he's sitting on the side of the pool, and I'm willing his will, okay? I'm encouraging him, and I'm telling him he can do it, and I'm telling him to try it. And finally he gets in, and when he gets in, it's like this. I'm holding him. My, my hands are like this, and he's laying over the top, and I'm walking with him across the pool, and the whole time he's doing this, this swim thing. It's kind of like a swim thing, right? And he goes all the way to one side, and he goes all the way back, and I lift him up, and I put him back on the side of the pool, and then I just praise him. I say, you did such a good job swimming. Now, I wasn't teasing him, right? I wasn't teasing him because he actually was swimming, right? He was the only one swimming. I wasn't swimming. He was swimming. I was lifting him up, and if I had let him go, he would drown. <laughs> he would sink. So he could not swim without me, but he was swimming. I also willed his will, right? He didn't want to do it, but because I helped him, he decided that he wanted to do it. So this is really similar uh, to how God saves us, is our faith is ours. We believe, we trust in him. But if he wasn't holding us up, we would just sink to the bottom. So when it comes to working out our salvation, you know, the thing to remember is that uh, our faith is not one of willpower, where God says, hey, listen, you're in trouble, you're going to drown, you better swim for your life, hope you make it. Right? That's not God's command. God says, hey, listen, you've already drowned. I'm going to lift your head above water, let you start breathing again, and then I'm going to carry you. But as I'm carrying you, you're going to learn to depend on me. You're going to learn to pay attention to the fact that you need me here, that I'm lifting you, and you're going to learn to trust me. And that's your part is to say, God, thank you for taking me to shore. And every time you stop trusting God to carry you, it's like swimming away from him. And you know what happens when we do that? We start to sink a little bit. And the farther we get away, the, the less we trust him, the more we find ourselves struggling to stay above water. And so the, thing, the really weird thing about our faith is that it's not like so many other religions where it says, hey, guys, do better, work really hard, and maybe you'll be lucky enough to make yourself good enough to get into heaven, whatever that version is, at the end of life. Instead, it's, hey, guys, you can't do it. So I'm going to lift you and carry you. All you have to do is trust me. All you have to do is trust me. So we believe because God lifts us up of the water, and we work along with him, but we only work. We only do anything at all because God's already doing it with us. So we should thank him. And we should never get prideful. If, if, we, think we're do, if we think we're crushing it as believers um, and we start to feel like prideful or arrogant over other people, we really need to remember that the only reason we're not sinking... <laughs> is because God is lifting us up out of the water. All right, so let's pray. Uh, Father, we do thank you. Uh, you are a miracle worker. You do rescue us completely, uh, Father. And uh, so I pray, Lord, that, that this church, this would be a church of strong faith and that what we believe in would not be in ourselves and our abilities and uh, our plans and our schemes and, and anything else that uh, would really be very human, um, would really be no different than any other group anywhere in the world, uh, but rather, Father, let the, the thing that marks us, the thing that makes us different, the, the thing that symbolizes who we are be our faith in you, our trust in you, 
and the fact that we are in awe of you and that we love you and, and that we're so thankful, Lord, and grateful uh, for what you have done and what you are doing. So, Father, it is true, God, that in the midst of your saving us, you are asking us to kick our feet and move our arms. Um, and, Father, that's obedience. Uh, but our obedience is always, always, always um, based on our trust and based on your help. And so, Father, let us be different in the way we work. Let us be different in the way we obey. Uh, and let us stay humble, Father, uh, for without you we are nothing. Um, and we, we thank you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn in them to Philippians chapter 2 and get into this text that Brandon started us, started us on already. So Philippians chapter 2, I'll read verses 12 through 18. This is God's word. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain nor labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So this is the Word of God. It is for us today, and it remains forever. Let's ask for God's help together. Father, we ask that you would dig down deep <clears throat> this morning and plant this Word in our hearts, and that we would love it. We'd love you more because of it and that you'd encourage our hearts and equip us for every good work. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, some of you know how much I enjoy uh, making bread. If uh, you didn't, now you do. Uh, I enjoy making a, a dairy-free uh, white bread uh, loaf, and I use honey in it. And the honey really, like the honey really just changes the flavor. It's delicious. It's one of my kids' favorites. I enjoy making bread rolls. I have two excellent recipes for those. One I found online and another that uh, was my grandmother's recipe, which uses lard. So they're excellent um, and delicious. And um, recently I've discovered uh, a brioche recipe to make hamburger buns with. And those are exceptional because they're so light and fluffy and perfect for hamburgers and, and sandwiches. Uh, the thing about bread dough, though, as you probably know, is that it requires a lot of work. Uh, you mix the ingredients, and then you spend time kneading the dough, which is, of course, easier if you have a mixer with a bread hook or even a, a bread machine. But if not, you... You fold and punch down and fold and punch down and fold and, and punch down over and over and, and over again. And then you wait hours before you can move on to the next step, which isn't even baking it. It's punching it down again and folding it again so that it can be shaped and then, and then rise again and, and be baked. And if you've never made bread before, right, if you've never made bread before, then you might say, well, that sounds like a lot of work. That sounds like a lot of work. But here's the thing. I haven't even mentioned all the work that's being done to even make that work possible, right? 
Like, none of the ingredients that I would use came from just nowhere. A farmer somewhere had to have soil that was good to plant wheat seeds in, and then he had to fertilize that soil, he had to water that soil, he had to wait on it to grow, and then he had to harvest it. And then he had to give it to somebody else that would grind it down into flour, which was then bagged and transported to a grocery store where someone else takes it off of the truck with a forklift, and then someone else puts it on the shelf so that I can buy it. And then just as many processes went into all the other ingredients, like the butter and sugar and milk in the recipe. And even all of that fails to mention how the ingredients themselves are working together in ways that I have no control over. Having put yeast into my dough, the yeast then does all the work. It eats up the sugars in the dough and excretes gas, which is trapped by the gluten, so that the dough has nowhere to go but up. And then it can go in and get baked in an oven I didn't design, or build. And don't even get me started on all the things that have to go right in my body for my hands to work and my eyes to work and my lungs to inflate and and on and on and on for me to be able to even put the ingredients together. And when you think about that, and when I think about this anyway, making bread from scratch doesn't seem like that much work. It seems more like a gift. And I think that Paul is basically saying the same thing here about our salvation. Um, Consider the main call of this passage already articulated for us this morning from the end of verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, understand that this is a call that's that's building on something. It's a building on a call to unity that's already been sounded several times in the letter. In 127, uh, Paul tells them to strive together for the gospel with one mind side by side. In chapter 2, verse 2, he tells them to complete my joy by being of the same mind and having the same love and being in full accord and of one mind. He goes on from there in chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, to tell us that that kind of unity is really only possible if we're humble. If we have Christ-like humility, he tells us to not do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count one another as more significant than ourselves. And then he says that Jesus himself is the cue for this, that Jesus himself is the example of this kind of humility that leads to unity. Now here, he reveals that that kind of humility is only possible if God himself has worked it in us. And so in 2.12 through 13, he says, work out this salvation which should lead you to humility and unity with other believers, with fear and trembling, that is, that is humility. For it is God who works in you, both to will for this and to work for this, for his good pleasure. And so it seems to me that working out our salvation is just another way of saying Pursue this Christ-like humility. Pursue this unity with other believers. Of course, that might not exhaust everything Paul is saying, but this is the context in which we find this command to work out our own salvation, that our humility and our unity with other believers is going to reveal something about whether or not you and I are growing up into the salvation that God has worked in us and is working in us. Of course, as Brandon already mentioned, the question in our mind might arise, well, if this is really all God's work, then why are we working ourselves? How are these two things compatible? You know, why, why not wait around for the bread to make itself if it all depends on God anyway? So what Paul does here is he gives three reasons that should appeal to the new heart that God has given us and given his people And so that's what I want to see together. Three reasons why 
we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That is to say, three reasons why we should strive to grow in Christ-likeness, why we should want Christ-likeness, why we should, should pursue that kind of growth in holiness, which lives itself out in our humility and in our unity with one another. And he gives three reasons in these verses, and so as we look for them, be on the lookout for all of the ways in which you need to be working this out in your own lives. Think about the kind of Christians and the kind of churches that God wants us to be as we work out this salvation, that how he wants us to shine our lights. I'd be particularly uh, on the lookout for maybe some untested standards that you have for ministry success, like the things that you might be looking for to be able to call your ministry to others a success. Paul, after all, says, I want to I, I, I see certain things in you to know that I'm not running in vain. I'm not laboring in vain. And so as we consider these three reasons to work out our own salvation, with fear and trembling, uh, be looking out for these sorts of things. So the first thing he says about why we should humbly work out our own salvation or strive for a Christ-likeness that leads to humility and unity is that this pleases God. Working out our own salvation with fear and trembling pleases God. Our salvation is a gift from God, and it's designed to bear fruit that pleases God. So he says in 12, As you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for what? For his good pleasure. And so, yes, on the one hand, having been saved, we do work, right? We do kick and paddle. There is dough to knead and fold and punch down and shape. Our, our work is truly ours. Our will is truly ours. Our desires, they can grow warm uh, we can cultivate new desires and cultivate new affections. And then our actions or our deeds or our work makes these growing cultivated affections visible to a, to a world so, so in need of a witness. So like people who have encountered the grace and forgiveness of Jesus and find in themselves new desires... We want to do things that cultivate and protect those new desires, like somebody who finds peace and security finally in Christ, and, and they don't find themselves needing to, to you know, run to alcohol for peace and security or some other temporary fleeting pleasure. And they don't just keep that stuff internal. They actually work that out. They actually try to protect that new desire. They avoid certain places. They go to meetings. They ask for other people's help. They might even help other people follow on the same path that they're on because they want to work out what's been worked in them, replace old pleasures and comforts with new and better pleasures and, and comforts. And that's the, that's the work that's done. And at the same time, we understand that even that work is a gift. It is God who's worked our work in us. I, I kind of like to think of it this way, um, that the many of us, you know, I, I think many of us are going to appear before the Lord one day wearing crowns, right? I think a lot of times there's pictures of saints uh, in the you know, book of Revelation appearing before God with crowns on their heads. You know, some of our crowns are going to say, 40 years sober. Some of our crowns are going to say, hospitable, right? and some of our crowns are going to say servant-hearted and self-controlled. Some of our crowns are going to say virtue, and these are all the sort of things we strive for, right? The things we long for, the things we're pressing toward, but on the day that we meet Christ face-to-face, -face, we're going to all take ours off and put them at Jesus' feet and say to him, this belongs to you. You gave that to me. This is yours. He works our willing, and he works our work. Martin Luther summed it up this way. He said, the love of God does not find that which is pleasing to him. The love of God creates that which is pleasing to him. 
That's the foundation of our assurance that when we meet Jesus on the last day, he'll be smiling on us, not because of our quality, but because of his quality. Not because of what we have come to present to the Lord, but because of what he gave. All that he demands of me and deserves from me, he's provided to me in Jesus. And that, that's the foundation of my assurance, and it's the foundation of my effort. It's the foundation of my work. He has provided me with all that pleases him. I need you to hear this. I need you to remember this. That God's pleasure in us is rooted in the gospel of Christ. Notice that all the commands in this passage are to be obeyed while, verse 16, holding to the word of life, holding fast to the word of life. So, so all that's commanded here, the working out of your own salvation, is, is commanded to be done while holding fast to the word of life which is the news or announcement of all that God has done for you in Christ and that you could not do for yourself. You couldn't pay for your sins and survive, but Jesus was able to do that. And by trusting in Jesus, you enter into the pleasure of God, that in Christ, God is pleased with you. All that's commanded you in this, of you in this passage, all the working out of your own salvation, the pursuing of humility, the pursuing of Christ-likeness, the pursuing of unity with other believers, and these are commands. But all of them are to be pursued, holding on to the word that God has provided and enabled all this by giving you his son. And so, yes, you should seek to please God. And you should seek to please God by increasing in Christ's likeness, but not because he is already displeased with you, but because in Christ he is already pleased with you and you are now free to go on pleasing him. You were, not, you were not free like this outside of Christ, but now you are free. You're free to grow. You're free to increase in Christ's likeness and to honor your Father in heaven. You know, oftentimes we think that of these commands, like the commands to unity, uh, that these are commands are given to us um, in order for our pleasure, right? That, that, the, that the point of the command is that, you know, folks, the church would be a lot nicer if you would all get along, Right? That, that that's for us, right? And of course it is. Church is nicer when we all get along, but that's not the first reason we're commanded toward unity. As we're working out this salvation which has been given to us and as we're growing in this salvation that should unite us together and that we share with all of these people that we're supposed to be united with, what's it for? Well, verse 13 tells us it's for the pleasure of God. And our pleasure in any unity that we have is just gravy. First and foremost, we get the joy of knowing that our growth and humble Christ-like unity gives pleasure to the God who saved us to live in exactly this way. So, these things are to be pursued. We're to humbly work out our own salvation because it pleases our God who has provided it. Now, oftentimes, you see this in, at Christmas time. Right? You give a gift to your kids. Those of you, are, you know, you can remember what it was like to give gifts to your kids. Right? This strange phenomenon of giving something to someone else and losing it. Like you lose it. You give it away. It's not yours anymore. It's theirs. And what do you get, though? You get the pleasure of seeing them use it as it's intended. And that's the kind of pleasure our Father has as we actually do with his salvation, what was intended. Uh, secondly, we should be humbly working out our own salvation or striving for Christ's likeness because this glorifies a good God in a broken world. So it not only brings God pleasure, but it glorifies him in the world. In verses 14 and 15, we're told to do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So the world here is described as crooked and twisted, which of course is an image of something that's 
not as it should be or not what it once was. In that regard, the times have not changed. And Paul says we're to be lights in that world as people who are, quote, blameless, innocent, and without blemish. Now, that may seem out of reach to you this morning. You might be uh, thinking about your, your past. You might be thinking about your most recent Tuesday and be feeling how far out of reach that is. So let's say what this does not mean. Let's say what this does not mean. It, it, it of course, doesn't mean that you've never done anything wrong, right? The closer we get to Christ, the more aware we are of all, of all, well, how aware we are of how deep the rabbit hole goes when it comes to our sin and our need for forgiveness. And certainly, it doesn't mean that we'll never sin again, right? As if meeting Christ brings us into a state where we suddenly do everything right or have reached full Maturity, we know from experience and we know from the commands and warnings that are written in Scripture to saved people that we continue to wage war on our temptations that are real temptations and, and grow out of our sins and faults and shortcomings. I mean, for crying out loud, Paul is, Paul is saying these things in a passage that's about growing in holiness. And so, of course, he assumes that we will continue to discover the depths of our need for forgiveness and repentance and growth. So it seems instead that innocence and blamelessness and being without blemish means instead that we've come into contact with the only one who can do anything about our sin. It means that now we know who to confess to. Before, we didn't know. We've been found by the only one who can be truly turned toward when we've sinned. I know some of you have had fathers that when you screwed up, you couldn't turn toward him and expect love and grace and forgiveness and help. Just understand that's not the way God is. And, and so the kind of innocence and blamelessness that the Bible talks about is, is not the kind of innocence and blamelessness that that fearful children think they have to live up to in order for their father not to frown on them. It's the, actually the kind of innocence and blamelessness that's found because we've turned toward a father who forgives and pardons and restores and helps and heals. As Christians, we find ourselves in this amazing group of people who've been found and changed and forgiven and renewed, and now we know who to run to. So, we do not shine as lights in this world because we are highly superior people who've arrived at perfection. Instead, we shine as lights in this world because we know where to run, because we're pointers to God's transforming and forgiving grace. You know, I had friends in college, they would sometimes... um, they would sometimes get in debates about uh, whether or not uh, Christians could still use bad language. Uh, that was $40,000 well spent. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they would get into these debates about, you know, uh, uh, this, and there would be two sides, one that think, you know, thought you could, should abstain from it all, and, and another side that... Uh, you know, said you shouldn't, you shouldn't abstain from it at all. And they would say that, you know, when lost people see that I'm just like them, well, maybe they'll be more comfortable talking to me about spiritual things. And you know, the reality was they just wanted more excuses to drop all the F-bombs they wanted to and, uh, and not feel bad about it. And the result, I think, was that um, they didn't really have any more spiritual conversations with lost people than anyone else did. If anything, they just had more lost people wondering why they should be Christians if all the Christians were exactly like them anyway. My, my point in sharing this story is, is this, that the unique glory of the church should be in how much like the world they are not. Not that we are sinless, 
that we've been changed into a people that have been freed to confess and turn from their sin. Rather than a cursing, disputing, grumbling people, right, who find their righteousness in their performance or skin color or income or job type or our manners or our work ethic have laid aside their grumpy, self-righteous quarrels and confessed their sin and are able to rejoice and rejoice in one another. This is another way we are holding fast to the gospel as we pursue this Christ-likeness. Holding fast to the gospel as we work out our own salvation is going to mean being able to rejoice in one another, rejoicing in the evidence of grace in one another rather than quarreling or disputing with one another. Again, we want the world to be able to look at the church and go, oh, they're just they're something off about them. They're just different than we are. In spite of the fact that they're also different from one another, you know, different ages, different backgrounds, different preferences, they're, they're all on the same mission. They all love each other. They all give each other the benefit of the doubt. They all help each other. They all work together. I just get, I get, the, feeling that, I get the feeling that they want to drop an F-bomb once in a while, but something keeps them from it <laughs> because something's been done to them. Something has invaded their lives. Something has made them all different and yet all sharing the same love. The glory that God gets from our unity and our holiness and our blamelessness isn't, you know, it's not that we come off as better than others or that we're even identical to one another or always think the same way, but that we're able to rejoice, truly rejoice in one another rather than dispute and grumble. We've all been saved by the same Lord. We believe in the same good news about what Jesus has done for me and for my brother. And so we're freed to look for evidence of grace in one another and assume the best of one another. And to the point, this glorifies God. This glorifies God. This shines our light in a world that's broken and twisted and hurting and disputing and grumbling. It displays to the world that God is as glorious and worthy as he actually is when he binds all these different people together and sets them on the same course of growing up together in the salvation that he's purchased for them. So we should strive for this because it glorifies God. It draws people to worship him like we do. Okay, lastly... We should humbly work out our own salvation or strive for Christ-likeness because this encourages Christian leaders and ministers to persevere. This encourages Christian leaders and ministers to persevere. So in 16 and 17, Paul says, we're to do this holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering, Upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Um, a little bit of a side note here. I mean, it's not totally a side, but it's a little aside. Uh, I think it's virtually impossible to dwell on this passage um, without giving some thought to who your pastors are. And what I mean by that is making sure that you know who your pastors are and they know who you are. Maybe I say this because we live in the internet age, you know, and there are people watching church online, and I don't, maybe this morning, I don't know. I don't pay a lot of attention to how many or who's watching online, but if, if you're watching online and you're able to go to church, you need to find a church. You need to get a pastor. You need to tell him, I want you to be my pastor, you can't do long-term New Testament Christianity without a pastor who knows it's actually his job to be your pastor and pray for you and care for your soul. I just don't know how to read this passage any other way. There are people that have a whole people under their charge and they're looking to those people to be able to evaluate whether or not they're running and laboring in vain or not. I just don't know another way to read it. You could say it this way. If you want every pastor in your life to give up, just make sure they never know you're free, they're free to pastor you. 
make sure they never know you are looking to them to care for your soul and help you follow Christ. The quickest way to do this would be to just tell that pastor or those pastors, hey, these are the believers I want to do ministry with. This is them. I want to do ministry with these folks. I want to be united with these folks, and I'm asking you to help me be united with them, even if it's a little uncomfortable sometimes. And that's the work I'm supposed to be about. I mean, it's people work. The work of a pastor is people work. And so my perseverance, just speaking from experience, my perseverance is strengthened not by items on a calendar, and it's not strengthened by how many chairs are filled. My perseverance is strengthened by knowing that I'm not laboring in vain because Christ is being formed in people. The things that keep me running are things like Ryan and Jillian and Gracie and Noah getting baptized and Alex pretty soon. He's told multiple people this is happening. Now I just committed him. (laughs) It's the baby blessings we're going to do in a couple of weeks for TJ and Aaron and Brendan and Lizzie, because I see you guys laboring to raise your kids to know the Lord. It's Mary's positivity and steadfastness in prayer. She's the only one crazy enough to meet with me at 6.30 in the morning. It took me far too long to realize maybe that was too much to ask. So now we meet at 8.15. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I love seeing the way John and Lisa use their home for ministry. Um, I love... um, um, Try this. Ask Gene how he's doing sometime. You'll hear blessed beyond measure. I like that. I love that gratitude and humility. Um, I love hearing stories of, um, from Peg and Amanda and Jean and Brenda and Karen in Ready Now Recovery and Jail Ministry. I like to watch Mary Kay interact with coffee shop guests and her husband Dan interact with our children. He treats them like blessings and not like burdens. I love seeing Mary Holdall's discernment in Bible study. I love the conversations that I have with like um, um, one of the most ones, recent ones I can remember that's coming to my mind is Clint and Kim thinking about how to minister to somebody that's far from the Lord. I love seeing how many of you care for your parents in their latter years. There's a I was talking with one of you, uh, this is about a year ago now, but the story has stuck with me. Um, You baptized as an infant, and um, but you wanted to join the, you wanted to join the church that you were in, and you needed to be baptized as a believer to do that, and so um, you decided that you would do it not only to love your church, but you'd also do it to show your boys that obedience to Jesus is a big deal. Now, admittedly, the list I just shared with you uh, is the formation in, formation in Christ in you that's not just happened in the present, but it's happened, you know, it's been happening for years. It's pre-discovery even at, at, at times. But those are the sorts of things that give your ministry leaders perseverance and strength to keep going, the things that keep your pastors from giving up entirely. And here's the thing. Those are the same things that'll keep you from giving up too. I want you to think with me like this, that ministry is people work. Ministry is people work. Judge its success by whether or not you are being faithful to see Christ formed in others. 
honestly assess if this is the way you view ministry. Because I'll tell you, our ordinary Christian church experience, I don't think conditions us to think this way. Let me give you an example. There's this great little book called The Trellis and the Vine that rocked my world about a dozen years ago. And it talks about this, this phenomenon that, yes, we, we will say that ministry is about people, but we are not typically conditioned to treat it like it's about people. And so the book poses this hypothetical scenario. It says, imagine this. Imagine a reasonably solid Christian said to you after church one Sunday morning, look, I'd like to be more involved here and make a contribution, but I just feel like there's nothing for me to do. I'm not on the inside. I don't get asked to be on committees or lead Bible studies. What can I do? Now, what would you immediately think or say? Would you start thinking of some event or program about to start that they could help with, some job that needed doing, some ministry that they could join or support? Now, just honest confession, that's usually how I think, and it works is the thing. Like, it actually does work. Like, if you get somebody involved and give them a job within six months, you can usually keep them around for a while. Here's the problem, though. If churches continue to think of people in terms of the roles they can fill, well, eventually they'll feel used. Or all the jobs will get filled and people will actually believe that there's nothing for them to do if all the jobs are filled. Now, I'm going to continue to share the quote with you. And this is the part where he talks about what needs to change in our thinking. He says this. He says, but if the real work of God is people work, right, which is the prayerful speaking of his word from one person to another, if that's the work, then the jobs are never all taken. And the opportunities for Christians to minister personally to others are limitless. So back to this hypothetical person who wants to be more involved, you could reply, see that guy sitting over there on his own? That's Julie's husband. He's on the fringe of things here. In fact, I'm not even really sure he's crossed the line yet and become a Christian. How about I introduce you to and I arrange you to have breakfast with him regularly and you can read the Bible together. Or see that couple over there? They're both fairly recently converted and really need a encouragement and, and mentoring. Why don't you and your wife have them over, get to know them, and read and pray together once a month? And then, if you still have time and want to contribute to the church some more, why don't you start praying for the people in your neighborhood and then invite them all to a barbecue at your place? Because that's the first step towards talking with them about the gospel or inviting them to church. That's really how simple ministry should be. And yet I'm betting that many Christians feel that that approach feels strange and uncomfortable. I'm not thinking of anybody in particular here. Like, don't think that... I, I think that, but generally, this has been my experience, that that approach to ministry makes things uncomfortable because it you know, doesn't fit ne neatly on a calendar. We don't always know how to become friends with people. And even more, I wonder if we're just too busy to do that kind of of ministry. Still others may worry that they can't spend themselves that way, that it would take too much to be available to people like that. So let me encourage you with this closing application. And it begins with Paul's reference to sacrificial offerings here in verses 16 through 17. We see Paul's mind and heart for ministry was a mind and heart for people. And as he talks about this, he pictures two sacrificial offerings. He has the, he's got the Philippians and their offering and their sacrifice of worship and service to the Lord. And then Paul pictures himself as a drink offering being poured out along with them as he serves and worships the Lord. The images from the Old Testament here, when the people of God would offer the best of their harvests, and when it was grape harvest time, a drink offering was emptied out on that regular burnt offering. And the point of it was to hold nothing back. You poured it all out. And Paul says, that's, that's a pretty good image for my life, poured out for others. But here's the encouragement I want to get to, and this is the application. 
Paul tells us there's joy after being emptied out. Paul tells us there's joy after being emptied out. Holding fast to the gospel as we minister to people this way means there is joy even after being emptied out. Notice Paul was glad, he rejoiced even to be emptied if it meant that Christ was formed in them. And he urges them to even rejoice with him over this in verse 18, saying basically, if this costs me my life, if I get completely poured out, I'm glad and I will rejoice and you should rejoice with me because it meant that I was poured out to see Christ formed in you. You know, many of us think we can only be poured out so much. And we actually think that what God uses is what we keep pouring out. When really it's when we're empty that he does his best work. And so I would plead with you to truly think about ministry together as people work. And pour yourself out a bit for others. That, that will keep us going. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we pray that you would work in us and that uh, we would work that work. And that we would not fail to hold fast to your gospel and that the good news of what Jesus has done would be for us our assurance, our effort, our work. And we thank you for this grace in Jesus' name. Amen. With you, brothers and sisters, um, as Corey likes to say, uh, let God's word be the last word. Uh, so receive this benediction, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go with God.